My name is Gianni Russo, a.k.a. Carlo, the infamous son-in-law from The Godfather. I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather, and this is my story. Before all of the wins in my portfolio, I was a little boy diagnosed with polio, experimenting with cures. I tried every one, felt everything in my right, but my left was numb. Walking with a limp like, will I ever run? Once again, or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun. Some people were cool, but not everyone. You never know who you're lying in a room with. So I broke a broomstick in half and let it groove with the concrete in the bathroom floor. It had a new tip, stashed it behind the toilet in case I ever had to use it. Cause one day Dolores had a chat with me. Said she got word someone was coming after me. My heart started beating rapidly. Speak softly loud and hold me warm against your heart. I hear your words, the tender trembling. Welcome, everybody. Another Hollywood Godfather podcast. And tonight we're really excited. You have met our honored guest tonight several times on our show. I'm more excited now than ever because in a letter that I received that he copied me on, he's working with a very dear friend of mine, Mark Wahlberg, which I know Mark was not aware that I knew Mark that well. Mark Wahlberg, we got a lot of Marks here. Mark Wahlberg and I used to go to Good Shepherd Church for about six (sighs) years straight every Saturday night prior to him being married and afterwards. And uh, I'm excited to hear that he's taking Mark Shaw's book to a documentary stage. So I want to introduce my co-writer first, Pat Picciarelli. Hi, everybody. And uh, our Millennium. Millennium, is that correct? Millennium. Yes. Millennial. 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 I'll, at the end. I'll, get, there you go. I'll get it right sometime. <laughs> Megan Horan. Hello, everyone. And not to waste any time of this precious man's time, because he's so hot right now, he has a new book out called Collateral Damage that's burning up airwaves, giving people sleepless nights, and it's going to get worse. Mark (laughs) Shaw, my man. Hey, thank you. And I didn't know you knew Mark Wahlberg. I'll pass that on to him. I had no idea. He knows me well. Wait till we get into it. All right. Good, good, good. No, thanks for having me on again. I appreciate it. Well, bring our audience up to date of how resilient you've been at getting getting down to the bottom of getting Marilyn Monroe her due by changing her means of death as possible suicide, which I never heard that as a description of death yet. <laughs> no, I haven't either. And you know, Cyril Weck, who you know is my forensic expert, and he, I think he said in he's had 62,000 uh, autopsies. He'd never heard a probable suicide. But as you know, in collateral damage, what I did is for the first time, um, it really was serendipitous how it happened, but I connected the deaths of not only Marilyn Monroe, but also our dear Dorothy Kilgallen, uh, who died in 65, Marilyn in 62, and then JFK in 63 and uh, looked at all the similarities between the three deaths and looked at the autopsies especially. You know, one thing that's come out of this, Gianni, that you and Patrick, and especially Patrick, I think, would know as an ex, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement officer, if you really want to cover up a death, the place to start is with the autopsies. Because in each one of those situations with each of the three people that I've uh, chronicled in collateral damage, uh, the autopsies were all bogus. Uh, Cyril Weck talked about JFK's uh, autopsy. He talked about Maryland's. Uh, uh, Noguchi even, uh, you know, admitted that he made mistakes. He forgot to uh, to uh, really inspect some of uh, Maryland's organs that he should have done, and then they they disappeared when he figured that out. And with Dorothy's, that autopsy has always been uh, uh, bogus. So that was one of the things that really set me off in trying to connect these people. And then I've used the clues as they come along, like an investigative reporter has done. I lay out the case like a prosecutor would, and then show that in this situation, what's different about this book than any other, people have written about Marilyn's death. They've written about JFK's death. They've written about Dorothy's death. 
But when you look at all of them to, to combined, they died within 40 months of each other, from 62 to 65. It really changes everything. And that's why I think the book has made so much difference as a breakthrough book for people, because they can, they can now see that there's uh, some patterns in there and what could have happened during those three years uh, to each one of these uh, remarkable people. Well, the interesting thing to our audience who hasn't listened to your prior interviews with us, and uh, Pat and I already congratulated you and thanked you for putting us in your book called Collateral Damage, which for mm -hmm. our listeners who don't know the book, you should go get it, because as Mark just pointed out, uh, we've all been involved with this directly or indirectly. Me, I was directly around Maryland for the last four years of her life and mm -hmm. uh, was with her the last weekend when basically she started making the announcements that she was going to go public against the Kennedys. And anybody that had any sense would know that you just don't do that at that time because they were so powerful running the country. And right. uh, Robert would never allow that to happen to destroy his career. Even you know, And as you pointed out, we had 40 deaths, very suspicious, and all the autopsies were covered up. Yeah, and that's what's disturbing about it, and and now it's even more disturbing. You know, as I, uh, as you guys know, I've done everything I possibly can. In fact, I put a timeline together the other day of all the injustices done to Dorothy Kilgallen since 1965 when she died, up until recently when a uh, detective sergeant from the cold case squad at NYPD got in touch with me, all excited about investigating and all of that. Well, that lasted about a week, and and so there's there's a real always been. No real reinvest, uh, no investigation of Dorothy's death, and then I think you know that I've been after uh, L.A. County uh, District Attorney George Gaston to reinvestigate Marilyn's death. I sent him the book Collateral Damage. I sent him a 375-page evidence report. I've just gotten in touch with him again, but uh, I think uh, that I that I let you know that I've really been uh, disappointed recently because of some comments that he made during the Sirhan Sirhan parole oh, that was uh, so hearings obvious. that were going on. It was and, so you know, obvious he was trying to cover up. Well, basically what he said is that he, he really idolized Bobby Kennedy and the Kennedys, and he really felt like that Bobby Kennedy would make a great president of the United States. Well, that's not the person who should be investigating independently Marilyn Monroe's death. So I wrote him a real strong letter, which you have a copy of. It's on my website, markshawbooks.com asking him to recuse himself and appoint a special prosecutor. Each one of these two women, I mean, for God's sakes, they shouldn't have died in the first place, but each one of them uh, was denied justice, and I've been fighting to get that justice for them. Uh, Mark, let, let, me, let me jump in here. Sure. Uh, he also ignored two of your original letters that you wrote him, correct? Yeah, the third one. It's the third one. Uh, I'm going to look at this from a law enforcement point of view. Sure. Uh, you've got a lot of evidence. What you don't have is a real smoking gun. And that's what they will need to open up a 55-year-old case. Uh, I, I know how cops work. I know he's a DA. He's still a cop. Uh, mm -hmm. Not going to allocate uh, resources to do this. You know, you ask him uh, to recuse himself. This is another reason that he will use not to answer you. And I, I know how they think. And as far as the NYPD goes, you're dealing with a defunded department. They lost $100 million in funding. They lost numerous police officers. They're down 15%. COVID killed 63 more cops. They're having problems now with the mask mandate. They just changed mayors. The cold case squad is down to bare bones. Uh, I, I, you know, I hate to disappoint, but you're not going to get any, any action from these people. Well, I, I disagree with you with regard to this whole smoking gun thing. Each In each case, Patrick, I've laid it out like a prosecutor would, and I can only tell you, I think there's something like three and a half million views of my presentations and interviews on, on collateral damage. And the, the feedback, of course, is, wait a minute, this is just logical. You've, you've used motive, opportunity, means, and benefit from the crime to really show what happened here. When you look at Maryland's case, it's, it's open and shut. I mean, Dorothy Kilgallen told her butler, it's the Kennedys. I've, I've proven all of this uh, information with regard to, I mean, Gianni came up with a, 
with a plausible means as to how Marilyn died and why. I have two other accounts now, one from a woman in Massachusetts and also June DiMaggio, Joe DiMaggio's uh, mother, who basically was talking to Marilyn the moment that she died. She heard Marilyn uh, screaming. She heard her uh, in, in peril. Uh, she could hear people in the background. And, and she basically admitted to her family that it was the Kennedys as well. When you look at Dorothy's case, this Ron Pataki, I mean, all you have to do is look at a poem that he wrote. Uh, this was her closest advisor, her closest friend. And basically, uh, she's the only one that he shared, she shared her JFK assassination investigation uh, evidence with. You only have to look at a poem where he basically, based on all the other material I've put together, uh, provides facts, and you know, as a, as a detective or as a as a as a police uh, law enforcement officer, he un he basically explains the very way that that she died that only a killer could know. I mean, all you have to look is is at that poem. So I I'm not going to give them an out here because there's enough evidence to at least reinvestigate uh, Marilyn's death and investigate Dorothy's for the first time and. You know, police were some of my greatest friends when I was a criminal defense lawyer, but but that's not an excuse that they can use. Let okay, me ask you a question. A let me make a suggestion here. Okay. I, I'm on your side. I read your book. Phenomenal. The amount of research. I mean, I'm, I'm a writer, and I'm, 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 I'm commenting yes, you are. Good one. to a writer's point of view. If somebody held a gun to my head and said, I want you to write something like this, or we're going to shoot you, I said, well, pull the trigger now. <laughs> I could never do this. I mean, it's phenomenal, and above all, it's readable. It doesn't read like a uh, journalistic work. It reads like a novel. That said, to get the attention that you need, you're not going to get it from the DA. However, have you thought about going to the press? Well, let me ask you, let me interject something, Pat, because I was just what I'm thinking about now, reading his last letter that we all read. I know Mark Wahlberg really well, and if Mark is willing to do a documentary, Mark will investigate this. He has the power, he has money, and that's the one thing, even when I was calling my colleagues in the Screen Actors Guild and all over, nobody wanted to come up to, and say, let's sign a petition like we tried months ago when Mark first came on with them. Nobody yeah. wanted to know about it, because they said mm -hmm. it's dead, and nobody, yeah. nobody cares. For Mark Wahlberg to put his money where his mouth is, and he wants to do a documentary, I think he can get the press because Mark can get press. When do you think that this documentary will air? I realize it's in the starting stages, but what's what's your considered opinion about when this will air? It, it'll take a while. There's no question. Probably in the fall of next year. But Gianni is just exactly right, and that's one of the reasons I've made a deal with this company instead of some other ones that had approached me because you know I could feel that uh, two things were important to me who can I get involved with this in a documentary that has the power to really get something done well he's answered that with Mark and the second thing I wanted to know and I got assurances from him you can't get you know everything promised for sure but they'll follow the accuracy of my book and I'm I'm convinced that they will do that so that's my best shot but in the meantime <laughs> In the meantime, Patrick, I got to give it a shot. I got to give it a shot. No, no, no. I, 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 have I, to. I, I totally agree. When I said go to the media, that is your media. So yeah. when, when this comes out, if you're going to be successful in your endeavors, that's going to do it. Yeah, well, Mark, I think it will. With, with your permission, with your permission tonight, I wanted to wait because, you know, I, we just received these letters knowing you were coming on. I'm very close to Mark many, many years. We worked on a script with um, oh, David O. Russell, 72 oh, pages, on the same subject. Mark read another script written by another great writer, George Gallo, who's currently writing a feature film for me now mm -hmm. about the same subject. So now, with your permission, I want to reach out to Mark, knowing that he's doing the documentary, and letting him know who who is back in on our team and we're doing things simultaneously for different reasons mm -hmm. so i think you know with mark alone he can get a studio with george gallo right now he just finished five feature films he's very hot 
as you know, directors go hot and cold. He's right. very hot. He just finished a De Niro film. Everybody's asking him to do his next piece. Well, mm -hmm. we're resurrecting a script he wrote called The Friends of Gianni Russo. He's <laughs> collaborating with Nick Vallelongo, who wrote Green Book, mm -hmm. who was writing a 10-hour series for us based mm -hmm. on our book. Mm -hmm. Now, we just raised $50 million independently, not wow. to go with any of the guilds, uh, restrictions of 40%. The, the guy, I can't give his name, he's well known politically throughout the world. He wants the movie made. And I think with Mark and this team now, you'll get all the publicity you want. <laughs> Well, I hope so, and and uh, you know, I'll I'll let them know that I, I I hadn't done so. I'll let them know that I was on the podcast and you talked about this. The I think you saw in the press release this uh, director, producer, editor guy has this fascinating idea in terms of how to use the new technology with regard to um, you know with regard to how to uh, create this story, and so I'm going to be very interesting to see how that comes out, but uh, as I said to Patrick, it'll take some time. It, it always does. Well, it should, if it's uh, going to be if, if it's gonna be worth watching, it's got to take at least six to eight months. Yeah, I think that's probably right, exactly. But it's well, not going what, away. That's the good news. That's yeah. what's probably going to put you over the top, that documentary. That's I the thing you noticed. Dealing with these people, Mark, one-on-one -on -one will get you nowhere, obviously. You well, mean the I'm, prosecutors. You're trying, about. you never know. I'm a and the eternal optimist, Patrick. Hey, one of us. <laughs> when you're you're talking about law enforcement, Pat. Yeah, I, that, well, that's I'm coming from a law enforcement point of view. Unless no. this, is, this, this is political, so unless the LADA gets a push, uh, and uh, Mark Wahlberg will provide that, his viewers of this documentary will provide that. It's going to make the press. That's going to give him the push. There that's you the go. That mm -hmm. they need. I think the political party and the, and the midterm elections is going to get this done just because there's a group against the Democrats, without mentioning who they are, they're gonna back Mark. Yeah. Mark's, Mark's got major power, politically and financially. Yeah, he does, that's for sure. I'm, I'm very blessed that they want to get involved in this. I, I wanna ask you both uh, your opinion on, uh, once again, a president of the United States uh, uh, refusing to, uh, Release the JFK doc, JFK uh, document, assassination documents. Did you expect that to happen again? Well, Pat has yes. a reason for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been I've been a real JFK assassination aficionado for years. I taught a whole semester course on the assassination. I'm up on it. When they when when they started releasing JFK assassination documents, I believe it was 2003. They were going to uh, release them piece by piece over many years, obviously it's 2021 now, and, and they're still not all released. Most of these release dates were delayed for whatever reason. You've got 55,000 documents, it's gonna take time to collate them. I don't think there was any nefarious reason here on the, on the, the, the president's part. He, his excuse was that because of COVID, they didn't have enough people to put this together, but they will release this, these documents. And I have no doubt that they will. Yeah, but Trump, hold it. Trump did the same thing. Three presidents prior to them did the same thing. I think there's pressure on the inside. Uh, there were many delays releasing these documents over the years. This is this is business as usual. Now, if he does it again or forgets about it, then I'll say, well, th there could be some kind of pressure, as you say. Well, let but me ask you a question. Have you ever seen documents delayed 55 years? Well, no, that was uh, that was le legally delayed. Uh, they had to be. Then it was a release date. Everybody was eagerly, eagerly anticipating the release. They got released a certain amount of them, and they promised the rest of them over the years. And they you know what? What they what they said in the previous three or four presidents. It was matters of national security. What exactly. bothered me this time is what the president said to protect against identifiable harm to the military defense intelligence operation law enforcement, or the conduct of foreign relations. What the hell does that mean? We're not gonna find and out. how can that be relevant? Well, we don't know until the documents are released. 
and they have to be released. The president has already weighed in on this. They're not going to let him forget about it. Somebody's going to jump on his case. I, well, my considered opinion is he's already committed himself. They've been released in the past. They'll be released. Well, we and shall see. Gianni, I want to tell you about something because I don't want to miss this, uh, something that I discovered because I think you'll find it very interesting because of your, your personal knowledge of Marcelo. Uh, a, uh, a supporter of mine in Dallas told me about an FBI file that I don't know if anybody had ever seen before. It's from 1968-69. Now, remember that uh, well, Mar Marcelo's wealth, according to, you know, uh, you know, experts at the time in 63, he had grossed many millions, 500 million from illegal gambling, a million from illegal activities, 8 million from this, 8 million from that, whatever. So he was extremely wealthy in 1968 before the president was assassinated. But if you want to look at exactly why he could not have let them deport him again or convict him of racketeering, all you have to do is look at this document because it is unbelievable what's in here. And I just wanted to, you know, to know, want you to know, first of all, what it does, it lays out about 30 informants that they had at the time who were right next to Marcello. And I'm telling you what, they were so close to him. There's information here about when he went to the bathroom, what he had for lunch, whatever else it may be. And it goes on and it talks about his brother, for instance, Joe Marcello, is not overly intelligent and probably will not be able to grasp the intricacies of Marcello's real estate transactions. <laughs> it has things like that in it, but more than that, it talks about this incredible empire he had in 68, 69, and this is just you know a few years after uh, the president died, uh, with land holdings. Uh, they talk about that he owned a piece of property worth 18 million. His net worth with regard to the last deal he made was 30 million. It talks about all of these uh, deals he made, for instance, you know, Churchill Farms that he had, that right. estate where he went to meet with everyone. He bought pieces of property by it so that the expressway that they were building would run through the property, which would have been worth, you know, millions as well. And I could go on and on. I'd love for you to take a look at it. But I'll tell you what was really incredible to me. Uh, on 2569, the source advised that Frank Ragano and F. Lee Bailey were staying at the Bourbon Orleans Hotel yesterday and met with Car Carlos Marcello. Now, you may remember, Ragano is the, run, is the one who represented um, Traficante. Yeah, um, he's out of Florida. Uh, James Hoffa and Marcello. Yeah. And then it said on 2-7, two days later, the advisor number 1734 PC advised that J. F. Lee Bailey and Melvin Belli met with District Attorney Jim Garrison or, at, of Orleans uh, Parish and Marcello. I mean, these things are mind boggling. I've never seen this before, have you? No, I heard about it though. Gosh, I mean, it, it's just amazing. No wonder he couldn't Possibly, and I think it in some ways, I wish I could prove that he was involved in Bobby Kennedy's death because the motive obviously was there. Well, the motive he was could there. Not I, let that... Bobby Kennedy become president of the United States because he knew if he did, Bobby Kennedy would come after him because Bobby knew he had orchestrated the, the death of JFK. Well, but I, look I, at what I, he right had after to lose he, here. Right after he was appointed attorney general, Bobby Kennedy with a with a, 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 a entourage of news reporters right. went to his house and arrested him in front of everybody. Yeah, and I he deported him. That's yeah, right. And I remember when Bobby threatened him, he called the reporters over and he said, are you threatening me? He said, no, I'm not threatening you. I'm going to kill you. I'm, that's not a threat. That's a promise as they put him in handcuffs. <laughs> Well, so, he, he wanted to kill Bobby, and as you know, he killed JFK to render Bobby powerless. But, hello. you know, you look at benefit from the crime. Patrick knows this. That's a big element of, of, of somebody taking another person's life, silencing them. And when I saw this FBI file, I just felt like that it shows again what he had to lose uh, if JFK had remained president. And obviously, Bobby Kennedy would have become president. Th th these guys can't let those kind of things happen. You know that. You, you know these people better than yep. anybody. Yep. No, I know. And that's what it was about. 
scary because, stuff. Because they had, they had, they made the deal. I remember overhearing that just from Costello. When I flew down to Dallas to bring somebody a suitcase, I didn't know who it was, and Jack Ruby right. picked me up. We went 30 miles out, and I'd been carrying money for years. Then a week, not even a week later, after that trip, is when Lyndon, Lyndon Bain Johnson announced he's going to be the running mate. We all know he hated the Kennedys. <laughs> they made nobody, a deal. Nobody hated them more except for Marcello, but Lyndon Johnson, boy, he's a beauty, isn't he? Wow. Oh, no, but, but see, what they did there, they made a deal that John would stay in for eight years, then Lyndon would be there for eight years. What Bobby was going to do in between that, nobody knew. But, as you know, this is a... This was a negotiated deal. And Santo Traficante and Johnny Roselli, if I don't know how many people have this knowledge, they were hired by the CIA right after the Kennedy assassination to go and become assassins to Fidel Castro. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Traficante was very close to Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. So they actually <laughs> trained them and with mm -hmm. stupid powder, because you know, Fidel Castro always used to stroke his beard. They, I mean, they had all kinds of stupid things that they were doing. And, but yeah, I, I find it interesting that. because Lee Harvey Oswald was trained by the Marines as Johnny Roselli to be marksmen, and they both shot dignitaries, <laughs> not enemies. <laughs> Patrick, what were you going to say? I said, yeah, uh, the, uh, uh, the CIA and uh, the mob in collusion to kill uh, uh, Castro, uh, that's, uh, everybody knows that now. It's been written in so many books. It's oh, documented. yeah. No, but I'm talking about when it was happening. <laughs> Nobody it's, knew it. Some of the hair-brain schemes, uh, the powder in his beard was to make his beard fall off like a defoliant. It was like Agent Orange for your beard. Uh, <laughs> They had a. They had exploding cigars. I mean, uh, hair brain stuff. Exploding <laughs> cigars. I love that. Yeah. Megan, you you're, you're, you're thinking. Like what, what are you thinking, Megan? Sitting here saying, "This is this is a this is a government at work." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. It's it's can, it's ridiculous. Let me tell you yeah, something else that I that I came up with because I think you'll be interested in it. If you'll remember in the, in the book, there's the, what I call the Rothberg Report, which was this document by the CIA that laid out the fact that they had wiretapped uh, Dorothy Kilgallen's uh, uh, telephone and, and her, her conversation with uh, this Howard Rothberg about UFOs and all of that. But in the first paragraph, it also talks about their wiretapping uh, conversations of Marilyn Monroe and Attorney General uh, Robert Kennedy. And then this is where they talked about that um, Marilyn was complaining the way she was ignored by the president and brother. She threatened to hold the press conference. It's even in there uh, references to bases in Cuba and a plan to kill the president. That, that document, it always concerned me because I'd never seen credible evidence of there being wiretapping in Marilyn's home. But uh, through some research a couple weeks ago, I, I, I'm sure you remember the actress Veronica uh, Hamill uh, on Hill Street Blues. Yeah. And uh, I found an account, and this is what it said, that in 1972, she and her husband uh, bought that home, Marilyn's home. They hired a contractor to replace the roof and remodel the house, and the contractor discovered sophisticated eavesdropping and telephone tapping systems that covered every room in the house. The components were not commercially available in 1962, but were, in the words of the retired, ju uh, retired Justice Department official, standard FBI and CIA issue. Wow. So you know how I like to confirm things that, that, that seem to me that are very, very important. And obviously, all of this with regard to what uh, how Marilyn was so upset about how the Kennedys were treating her and everything and what's in this CIA document, I think that account by Hamill there's no reason for her to lie about that. Uh, really uh, confirms a lot of that, don't you think? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. it, again, Pat, 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 Pat's the detective, but the evidence is overwhelming. But who's going to allow it to happen? That's the thing. That's my mm -hmm. point. You just have to get you have to get that uh, rush of uh, you know Joe Citizen saying we want action here. See, you know, and I think the, I, I know I know morally Mark Wahlberg. 
I know how he thinks. This kid's a great kid, mm -hmm. and he's he's got so much wealth now, and he and he he likes. I mean, and he's very religious, and 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 that means something to me. Means something to him, and I we had numerous conversations about this personally, him and I, one on one. Mm -hmm. So I think he's going to jump all over, getting Marilyn straightened out. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know about D Dorothy Kilgallen, or that'll just evolve because of it. But I, I think you're really struck on something now. And as I said, with your permission, I'd like to follow up with Mark and let him know what we're doing on our end and that we're available for anything that can, you know, collaborate and embellish what you need to have done. You know, an attorney in Los Angeles who's a friend of mine and been a good supporter, when I told him about this potential offer from Mark's company, the first thing he said was, and it applies to both of you as well and, and Megan too, he said, Mark Wahlberg is a man of integrity. Yep. And I thought to myself, that's who I want to be involved with here. So that's why I went forward with that uh, with that deal. So, um, uh, yeah, he's a stand-up guy. That's for sure, it seems. And he's got the money. He don't need to yeah. go anywhere. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yes, absolutely. Hello. So we'll see. <laughs> I got a lot of hope there. And, and Patrick's right. You know, I'm probably... Um, you know, I, I'm an eternal optimist, and so I keep trying things, but uh, thinking that there must be somebody out there. I did send the letter to a reporter at the Los Angeles Times, and she uh, emailed back that she got it. So whether she might do anything with the letter or not, I don't know. But, you know, again, in, in this day and age, we don't have investigative reporters like we had back in Dorothy's. No, nobody wants to ruffle anybody's feathers and get no. fired. <laughs> no, everybody's worried about their their kids going to school and their mortgage payments. Integrity means nothing. Yeah, unfortunately. Mark, if I could ask you something real quick. The evidence, sure. the evidence that you're bringing up to us now, has this been what you found post-writing collateral damage? Is this all new stuff? Uh, some of it is, yes. Most, A lot of it is. Of course, the, the report I talked about, the CIA document, is in collateral damage. But this new evidence confirms that. Uh, the Marcello situation with motif uh, to have killed, to have orchestrated JFK's death and potentially be involved in Bobby's. Well, the FBI uh, file, you know, is is something I just found recently. So it connects with those things. I'm always trying to connect this evidence, kind of like I used to do as a defense lawyer. And 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 I'm sure what Patrick did when he was was a police officer. You want to, you know, come up with as many verifiable accounts of things happen. Uh, they happen, and and that's what I've been trying to do. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I've given this to you guys first. I I wanted to do that. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate but, your support. It means a lot to me. Yeah, but I I think you've given us the ammunition now to work with the powers of be, like the Mark Wahlbergs and the George Gallows and people who get attention and have studio backing. But I think Mark's documentary and my guys are going to meet with his people also just because we could spin this first with the documentary, then follow up with our stuff. And it, it's going to snowball. People are going to have to wake up and say, we can't sweep this under the rug. Mark, can I ask you a question uh, to get off the subject a bit? What's your opinion about uh, Robert Kennedy Jr.'s backing of Sirhan Sirhan's parole? Well, first of all, I've never been involved with a district attorney like George Gaston, who basically said, uh, we're not going to have anything to do with the uh, parole situation with, uh, with Sirhan Sirhan. Uh, once there's a conviction in the court, our job is done. I've never heard of that before. Why so that was very disappointed that they didn't go in there. This is a jury of 12 people who convicted Sirhan Sirhan. And, and he needs to uphold that jury verdict, but he didn't. Why I, don't he know what, I don't know what's gotten into Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, he used to be this environmentalist, uh, all, all good, uh, worried about the world and all of this. He's gotten into all this anti-vaccine thing. That's up to him. But for he and another member of his family to march in there and say that basically uh, the man who they, have, they, have, they proved in court had had uh, assassinated um, his father uh, seemed to me to be way out of line, and apparently a lot of the other Kennedy family felt the same way. I'm Why a big one more thing. I'm a big believer in jury verdicts, 
and and that jury verdict, uh, you you could you can go ahead and you can uh, disagree with it and all of that, Patrick. But those twelve people heard the evidence and they decided he was guilty of of killing Robert Kennedy, and and the penalty then was imposed as it should have been. I think that should be left alone. No, I don't disagree with it at all. I think you're absolutely right. My question was, why do you think? Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. is supporting Sirhan Sirhan's parole. Bobby Kennedy was the run of the litter of the Kennedy family. He always wanted to prove to his uh, his uh, his father and his brother Jack that he was worthwhile. The man became an attorney general when he had never stepped into the courtroom before. When here here's uh, Joe Kennedy with uh, his wife, uh, which I, I found a great biography of her, Rose. But he had his trophy wife, didn't uh, trophy girlfriend, Gloria Swanson. In fact, I found some evidence for for Joe. Where they went on a ship to England, and on one end of the ship was Marilyn uh, was uh, uh, Rose, and on the other end was Gloria Swanson. That's how audacious he was. Then you got Jack Kennedy, with regard to the whole situation with. Yeah, he's got Jackie, but he's sleeping with everyone he meets on a street corner. So now Bobby comes along, and here comes Marilyn Monroe. And he's got a wife with a zillion kids at home, Ethel. And then he's going he's gonna to show his dad and his brother, well, I can have a trophy wife, too. Bobby Kennedy, as always, Bobby Kennedy Jr. has always wanted the limelight. He's always wanted to be important. And I think that's what this is all about. Some way or another, he decided to jump into this, and I think that's the motive. That's a hell of a thing, your own father, you know, I mean. Well, his father, I mean, it's funny you brought up Gloria Swanson's apartment because in the Grace Building here on 65th Street, apartment 8H, he bought Gloria Swanson. It was their love nest. How's that? I did not know that. Because but you see, Bobby, that's how Bobby was. That's, no, that's what was what, all. The reason I know that, that, Costello used to meet him over there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's a book in itself. Hello. <laughs> no, it's it's crazy how all of this inter, interwines, man. But like you, I Bobby to me is always a wannabe. Yeah. And he's going to get yeah. there any way he can. And I have to say this before we wrap up. My life is packed with these kinds of moments for some reason, okay? So it ends up being Mark Wahlberg's company that decides to uh, put into development a, a documentary about my book, and then I get on this program, and who's one of his best buddies but you? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. Come on. Well, you know, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Figure that out. We, we were online at Good Shepherd Church at 5.30 Mass for Communion week after week after week. Then we And he was a fan of mine because of my, my work as a godfather and all that. And then I spent days with him on the fighter while oh. David O. Russell was directing yeah. him. And we yeah. all we were talking about, and David wrote 72 pages of my life story. My then goodness. David and him had a falling out. So I went away from it because he said, no, I will never work with him. And I said, no problem. But here we are again. Now we're going to get thrown back into it, I think. Absolutely. Mark, are you surprised? Are you surprised? Who doesn't this guy know? What's that? I said, are you really surprised? Who doesn't this guy know? Uh, well, apparently everyone. So I'm going to watch <laughs> myself because I have kind of a background that I've kept quiet, the prison years and things like that. So I'm going to be careful with who I talk to. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Too funny. Is there anything else you wanted to share with us or our listeners before we wrap up? Anything no. you didn't cover that you would like to? No, thank you. I, I'll answer anything you want to, but this has been terrific. And I, I will say, I will show you one photograph that might be of interest to you. Uh, I, I happened to find it just recently. This is a photograph of uh, uh, Pat Lawford, uh, Peter Lawford, Frank Sinatra, uh, Marilyn Monroe, and... Uh, uh, let's see, there's one other actress in here. I can't think of her name. Uh, but they're at uh, Lawford's beachfront home in Santa Monica. And you know, that's where uh, Marilyn first met, as I understand it, uh, JFK before happy birthday time and all right, of that. Right. And then that's where he spent time with uh, Bobby Kennedy. So that's another confirmation that I found recently of the fact that this is how Marilyn was involved in that that nest of uh, uh, Peter Lawford and the Kennedys. Well, Lawford, Lawford vowed to Sinatra 
that he could control his brother-in-law. And they were going to the Sands Hotel two years prior to even the nomination on the weekends. Uh -huh. And everybody was there. He, JFK had his way with, I mean, you read my book. I mean, you name it. He was like, a, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's an Just like his dad. Thing. Yeah. Oh, worse like than his father. Dad. Yeah, maybe so, if that's possible. But yeah. we, 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 we're going to announce on this show right now, and Megan was in the meeting with me today at WABC, and we're uh -huh. moving our platform to a network now. Uh -huh. Yeah, so now... Guess, who's, guess whose show I was on uh, last week? We didn't talk about any of this, but guess whose show I was on last week? Cat's Roundtable. Johnny Casabatidis. Yeah, he, he's had me on four or five times. I had a great time again. They had like an ex-governor on there with me and all kinds of things. We talked about the JFK documents and all that. So terrific. Yeah. So John and Margo are very close, and he's been trying to lure us over. And uh, I, Megan and I went over to see the set today. And so we'll ah. be there soon. But we'd like to have you back on now over there with what we're doing with green uh, screen and film and making uh, this and we're going we'll be on three different platforms we'll be on podcast radio and streaming tv oh this is just great congratulations yeah. that's terrific thank you thank you in just fact terrific. i'm sorry Meant pat how to hear this on this show <laughs> Like the, 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 that's like the guy who finds out he's getting divorced because he reads it on page six. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know we've been working on it, Pat, but we were so excited that we went on the air. We just left there an hour and a half before we came on the air. Oh, that's just terrific. So Good for uh, you. So next week we'll be live from there. Oh, my. Wonderful. Good yeah. for you. Good for you. And we have a friend of yours coming on, Mark yeah. Seal. Uh, with his new gun, but, uh, his book, you know, Mark from Variety, one of the best writers in Variety. I'm afraid not. I don't know everybody like you do, you know. Okay. okay. Well, he, he's been following the friend. Godfather since day one, and he okay. has a new book right now out that you should Good. read, right, Pat? Right. I, ju I just finished it. Uh, very readable. This was an in depth dive into the making of the Godfather. It's like 480 pages. Uh, thing you wanted, uh, ever wanted to know. And uh, interesting stuff. I read it in two days. I mean, what's, was, the, what's the name of the book, Patrick? What's the name uh, of the book? Leave the Gun, t uh, uh, Take the Canola. Ah, wonderful title. Good title. Yeah. Simon and Schuster. It's, but so I, we, I wanted to share that with you tonight and our audience because this will be very timely. This will be coming out and they'll be able to go to WABC and find us. So it's good. Good, great, just great. So happy for you. No, I knew you on Katz's show, about, I think two Sundays ago or whatever it was. Well, this was last Wednesday or whatever. It was. Uh, oh, he does it every I, day I, now. I, I think. In fact, we got it. We had quite a laugh at the end because I said two, uh, two uh, things that happened uh, by my uh, publishing collateral damage. Number one, they should rename the Hoover uh, book FB uh, the Hoover Building in Washington D.C. where the FBI is, and two. They should rename the Robert Kennedy Bridge, which used to be the Brooklyn Bridge. And whoever this ex-governor was who was with us, I, I don't remember his name, he jived in. He said, wait a minute. I na I got that bridge named after Robert Kennedy. What am I going to do if you get that done? And I said, well, just name it after John. <laughs> and they got a laugh out of that. It was fun. John would love that. You know that. Good man. Oh, he's 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 quite a character. Yes. Good. Was I like him. Jackie Mark? Hey, thank you so much. Hey, God, we'll be in touch. All right. Bless you. Thanks. Thank, thank, Thanks, thank Mark. You. Thanks, Megan. Thank, thank you, Mark. Mark. Thanks for okay. coming back on. Pleasure. Bye-bye. All right, we're going to take Bye -bye. a fast commercial break, make some money. We'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. Hi, Patrick Picciarelli here. Before we get to our listeners' emails, a quick word about the new fiction book series I've launched. Private investigator Ray Yale tackles his first two cases in Bloodshot Eyes, and The Pop Line. Both books are in paperback and are available on Amazon.com. I've been a PI for 30 years, and these books are based on my cases. Enjoy. Okay, it's time for the mailbag. All right, let's get to it. I think we have time for a few. Okay. First one is from Sean. Sean says, I was listening to Johnny Dare Morning Show, and he was talking 
to James Jude Courtney about his character Michael Myers in Halloween Kills. Johnny mentioned to James about Gianni's life, his role in The Godfather, about the book and the podcast. James said that he would have to get the book. Just thought it was cool that Johnny Dare promoted your book and podcast to an actor. That's Great. that's amazing. Who's that guy, though? I don't even know who that is. <laughs> well, he plays Michael Myers in the new um, reboot of Halloween with Jamie Lee Curtis oh, and wow. Kyle Richards. And it's the new, yeah, well, how, the new. It's in the movies, and it's on HBO Max. And he, he mentioned the book? That's yeah, cool. apparently he mentioned you, your role, the book, the podcast, all of it. So, wow! Thank you, Johnny Dare. Yep, please. All right. Next is from Nathan from Melbourne, Australia. Nathan says, "I've just finished Bloodshot Eyes and I loved it. I've read the Ray Yale books in reverse order, and I really love your writing style, Pat. The way you write makes me think I'm in New York, despite living around ten thousand kilometers away. <laughs> in the book, you mentioned parking near fire hydrants. Can you tell me the significance of this?" And can we expect a new Ray Gale book soon? What about fire hydrants? I missed that. He parking said, in the book you them. mentioned parking near fire hydrants. Can you well, tell me the significance of this? I don't know. Because it's an open I, spot? <laughs> I don't know what the context is. Well, in Melbourne, uh, they don't have fire. Ex uh, yeah, maybe it's not a, maybe it's not illegal to park near a fire well, hydrant well, in well, Australia. Fire hydrants, for those of you who don't have them, who live in a small town America, they, they pump water in case of a fire. You can't park within 15 feet of them in New York. That's so basically. they have access to put the hoses to the fire trucks. Yeah, yeah. you know what, what What? the FDNY does? If you're parked on a hydrant and they, they need it, or even if they don't need it, if there's an alarm pulled for fire on the block to make sure that there's not a fire or that there could be a fire, your car's parked in there. They, they will break out both windows of your car and run off. To get the hose through? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. I don't recall... Uh, what the context was of my of that fire hydrant uh, episode because I wrote the book a while ago. But if that's what you were talking about, that's the answer. I don't remember exactly either. I have read the books, but maybe Ray Yale was needed a quick parking spot, and that's why he jumped in front of a fire hydrant or something. Well, maybe he thought he was a dog and he had a pee. <laughs> uh, the it's your question. character. It's your brainchild. <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm quick. Uh, a, a a third uh, Ray Yale book? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll, it'll come. I would love it. I love those books. Thank you. Highly recommend. So the rest of Nathan's message says, as for all of you, thank you for your work on the podcast. It has been something to look forward to in the world's most COVID lockdown city. Yeah, Australia was very locked down. Wow. Might still be at this point. Who knows? All right. Next is from Jimmy. Jimmy says, Gianni, did you know Duke Mitchell? Yeah. I see he was a lounge singer in the mold of Dean Martin and dubbed the King of Palm Springs, also credited with pioneering the Sunday brunches trend and his movie Mafia Massacre inspired Tarantino's Pulp Fiction. I used to date Duke Mitchell's daughter. <laughs> of course you did. Of course you did. I love Duke. He was a great guy. Naturally. Man. Yeah. Everybody and everybody in Palm Springs went to see him. They loved him. Sinatra, everybody went. He was very revered by so many great and because he treated them well and he had a whole lounge career forever Duke Mitchell it's amazing mm -hmm. pretty door, pretty girl though too if I remember right <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on next is from Carlos Carlos says I'm originally a New Yorker but moved to Utah 30 years ago and just returned for a visit I went to Chinatown and noticed the presence of gangs seemed to have vanished. Is this true? Has law enforcement cleaned up the neighborhood? Well, that's what they like to tell you. The uh, uh, Our outgoing mayor mentioned Chinese gangs uh, a while ago. I don't know which term he was in, but he basically said they're gone. Well, they're not gone. Uh, they're still there, but uh, they acclimated. Back in the 70s and 80s, when you took your life in your hands going to Chinatown, uh, as a tourist, you can easily pick out the gang members. They they all dressed like they were extras in Miami Vice. They had spiked hair. They all carried around brick cell phones because you, you couldn't conceal them. Then they were you know, the, the the dawn of the cell, the cell phone era. Uh, they they looked alike. They all ha had thousand dollar Dupont lighters. I mean, that's the way they looked. They all looked the same. But they wised up when they started going to prison. Uh, they're still doing what they do. They blend in. The gangs are still there. They have the same power. They're still the enforcement arm of the Tongs, but they've taken most of their crime off the street. They're heavily involved in computer crime. They're still shaking down 
uh, fellow Chinese businesses, nothing's changed except mm. violence. They learned how to work together. Mm, interesting. All right. I think we have time for one more. This one is from Steve. Gianni, what's the latest up, updates on your clothing line? When can we expect a website? I think while you hear this show, it'll be up. We've had problems like everyone else in shipping and getting goods in for the holidays. But as I said, when this show airs, go to La Cosa Mia by Gianni. And that's the website. And you'll be able to order clothes. Thank God. Fingers crossed. All goes as planned. Yep. All right. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. A bitty, bitty, bitty. That's all, folks. Um, <laughs> Pat, M Megan. Johnny. Till next week. If you're feeling sad and lonely, there's a service I could render. I'm the one who loves you only. I could be so warm, so tender. Call me. Don't be afraid. You can call me. Maybe it's late, but just call me. Tell me and I'll be around. Oh, Thank you for tuning in to the Hollywood Godfather podcast. You can contact Gianni Russo, Patrick Picciarelli, or myself, Megan Horan, with your questions and comments through the contact section of our website, hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com, which is where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can also call and leave us a message at 646-776-3038. Remember to follow us on Instagram at Hollywood Godfather and on Facebook, as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd like to know what you like about what we're doing, what you'd like to hear in the future, and anything else you might suggest to improve our podcast. Most importantly, hit the subscribe button. We'll be back next week with stories of the mob and Hollywood, as well as answers to your messages. Just call me, tell me and I'll be around I'll be around Give me a call Seventeen, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for small town girls and soft summer nights. We'd hide from the light. I didn't mind.